We are very honored to be part of Project Ukraine. Many amazing History Channels have come together in their pursuit of presenting the historical past and drawing attention to the current times. Watching videos about important historical events on YouTube can be entertaining for many, but lots of times, history is not just about leaders, emperors, or strategies on the battlefield, but about ordinary people, their struggles, and their crises. Nowadays, we are witnessing a humanitarian crisis with our own eyes in Ukraine. Therefore, we can do more than just watch. Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv is focusing on raising funds and delivering humanitarian aid for the Ukrainian civilians. They provide food and medicines to elders, people with disabilities, mothers with small children, and other vulnerable persons. They also help with evacuation of people from combat zones. Little by little, together, we can make a difference and create an island of hope in this ocean of sadness and terror. By accessing the link in the description, you can donate to those most in need and help with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Just a hundred years ago, Ukraine and Russia were not necessarily the best of friends then either. In fact, by 1917, they were free-falling into a catastrophic war. The first major domino to fall can be identified as the October Revolution, which occurred in Russia in 1917. After overthrowing the Tsar in March, the Bolsheviks next aimed to overthrow the provisional government that took over. With Vladimir Lenin at the helm, the revolutionaries hoped to replace the ruling class with a Bolshevik communist regime and a coup d'etat that led to a full-blown civil war. This conflict would carry on until 1923. But Lenin had already established his own government in Russia, and they were on the way to forming the Soviet Union. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, after attempting to loosen ties with the new Russian Republic, the Ukrainian National Republic was founded as an autonomous nation within the Russian Republic on November 20th, 1917. This was a direct reaction to the contemporary chaos over the border in Russia, and because the Ukrainian authorities heavily condemned the Bolsheviks. Nevertheless, the revolution would quickly begin to reach its tentacles next door. By December, armed uprisings by Bolshevik revolutionaries were already popping up in Ukraine. But so far, the latter was able to quell these outbursts and deport those involved. The situation would scarcely stay simple for long though, as the Bolsheviks became more determined and aggressive. On December 17th, the Council of People's Commissars in Petrograd demanded that Bolshevik troops be granted permission to be stationed within Ukraine, and if this was not done, severe action would be taken. The Ukrainian Republic, however, had no interest in entertaining such an ultimatum and flatly refused. By this point, it was clear that diplomacy would go nowhere for the Bolsheviks, who had already proclaimed their own Ukrainian government to combat the existing one. War was the only option left. War was declared by the Bolshevik government against their opponent on January 2nd, 1918, and by the end of the same month, the Ukrainian National Republic cut all ties with Petrograd as pro-Bolshevik Soviet forces marched into Ukrainian soil. The fighting force of the Bolsheviks numbered around 30,000 in total, and was made up of garrisoned units, Russian army regulars, and detachments of the Red Guard. They also had the support of local Bolshevik revolutionaries in Left Bank Ukraine, who prompted uprisings in correspondence with the invasion of troops from Russia. This was all launched against a Ukrainian force of nearly half, totaling only around 15,000, and consisting of volunteer detachments and a handful of free Cossack and Sikh riflemen battalions. By the end of January, the Bolsheviks had already made a swift and undeniable impact on Ukraine's stability, taking cities from Kharkiv to Lozova to Poltava, Bakhmak, and more. With the next target being Kiev, the UNR became desperate to defend their capital. At first, the Sikh riflemen and free Cossacks had managed to keep hold of the city after being challenged by another attempted uprising. But as more Bolshevik troops marched toward the capital, the Ukrainian government had to reconsider whether they were even capable of holding off the invaders in any sense. The outlook was grim by now, 
and the UNR authorities were concerned that a final stand in Kiev may decimate their defenses entirely. As a result, the capital city was evacuated on February 8th, all but handing it right over to the Bolshevik forces, who arrived the following day. With the capital now under their control, the Bolsheviks next turned to right-bank Ukraine, completely unaware of the plot twist that was about to occur. Unwilling to give up entirely, the Ukrainian authorities, on the same day they lost Kiev, signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which meant that Germany and Austria-Hungary were set to enter the war on the side of the UNR. Roughly 450,000 troops were sent into Ukraine by the Central Powers, which abruptly changed the tide of the entire conflict. Now, it was the UNR who pushed their rival out of the right bank and retook the capital by the start of March, continuing the counteroffensive through the left bank. The only issue for the UNR at this point came when the Germans noticed that the current government, the Central Rada, had enacted some policies that were affecting the exportation of foodstuffs to the Central Powers, which was what Ukraine was supposed to provide in exchange for military aid. Instead of changing the earlier agreement, the Germans replaced the Central Rada with the Hetman government as the combined Ukrainian-German-Austro-Hungarian military forces continued to beat the Bolsheviks into submission until they eventually were forced to sign a peace agreement with the UNR on June 12th. But this success for Ukraine would be short-lived. In November of the same year, the Directorate of the Ukrainian National Republic overthrew the Hetman government, rekindling instability that the Bolsheviks took full advantage of. Attempts at forming a successful peace deal between Kiev and Moscow failed, and by the start of 1919, another full-fledged Bolshevik invasion erupted. It didn't take long for the previous battles to repeat themselves, as the left bank fell to the Bolsheviks just as it had before, and Kiev would be fled yet again by the Ukrainian government. From there, a tug of war occurred as territories and troops were shifting back and forth while the war raged on. This would continue until around October, by which point Typhus was tearing through the Ukrainian forces and would eventually wipe out over 70% of the troops. This severely weakened the Ukrainian odds, but the signing of the Treaty of Warsaw with Poland in April of 1920 would see a renewed hope for taking down the Bolsheviks once and for all. This wouldn't last long, though, as in October, the Polish government would sign a peace treaty with the Bolsheviks, ending their aid to Ukraine and leaving the latter once again weakened and alone. In November of 1921, the UNR tried one more time to strike the Bolsheviks with the Second Winter Campaign. The goal was to rekindle enthusiasm and a spirit of uprising within Ukrainian peasants and partisans. But the campaign resulted in a devastating failure, with 443 men being captured and 359 of those troops being executed by the Bolsheviks. Although partisan fighting would carry on against the Bolshevik forces throughout Ukraine, this was the undeniable and rather humiliating end to the Soviet-Ukrainian war. The aftermath of this years-long conflict would be devastating for Ukraine's hopes of independence and severed ties with Russia. Instead, the Ukrainian National Republic, now replaced by the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, would become one of the founding members of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics on December 30th, 1922, and the government of the UNR was forced into exile, no longer able to fight back. Of course, many Ukrainian nationalists would attempt to do just that for years to come through partisan guerrilla warfare, but this would prove futile. When the Holodomor, or terror famine of Ukraine hit, the final lights of hope in Ukraine were snuffed out. Ukraine would from that point on remain a part of the Soviet Union until 1991. On August 24th, the Supreme Soviet Parliament of Ukraine declared that it would no longer follow the laws of the USSR, instead only obeying those of the Ukrainian SSR. A few months later, on December 1st, the citizens of Ukraine were given an independence referendum, in which an overwhelming majority voted in favor. 
The Soviet Union as a whole collapsed soon after, and at long last, Ukraine was officially independent. Although the Soviet-Ukrainian war began and ended a century ago, and Ukraine freed itself from the shackles of the USSR over three decades ago, this period of the past would leave not only a mark on history books for centuries to come, but it also plays a largely significant role in the relationship between Russia and Ukraine today.